we're looking at the idea of the overview of what the uh, perception camp is. We're going to give you some definitions, especially of what we mean by perception. Look at the benefits and then also give you an overview of the format, how we're going to go about through our learning during our time. And what's interesting for me is that on some of the uh, items that we're going to be showing you, they're reversed. Uh, so the reading is backwards. And I just thought that was a riot that uh, our technology is at the point that we still are going right to left and left to right. So bear with us as we, as we present to you different things. We would like to show you just a, a two and a half minute overview. And again, bear with me because the writing on this particular book that you're going to see is backwards. And we know that. And we'll correct it by the time we get together again in July. So here is an overview of why we created Perception Camp. So everyone's just seeing your desktop at the moment, Michael, and I'll let you know when it shows. Is it showing now? Uh, not yet, but it will, I'm sure. We've got a grey screen at the moment. Okay. Excuse For those, me, those of you who are out there, we've tested and tested this, but this GoToWebinar, whilst it works at one level, there's still some things you've got to master with it. I think we're okay now. We're back to your desktop. Yep, there we go. There we We've go. got the statue in your picture, so you're going to show that. Yep, we're fine now. We can see it. And you have to be able to spell the word backwards now. It's called Blink. Mm -hmm. Great book. Turn the, yeah, it's the... <laughs> we're not getting sound yet with the video, Michael. Nothing's coming up, Michael. Just a minute. Okay. In, in the meantime, if there's anybody who's got specific questions and outcomes they would like to get from this webinar, I can pick up your chat line. I have unmuted everybody because the noise that was coming through. All right, we can see the video again, Michael. Can you see the video now? Mm-hmm but you couldn't hear the sound. No. Huh. I can't. Wendy, you can't I... either? No. We tested and tested oh this, but it's... Let me try it one more time. Mm-hmm. You're now on big screen. Might be because you have the earpiece in. I don't know. Say again, Margot. Might be because you have your earpiece in. I don't know. I can hear sound very low. That is a mystery. Mm. Let me try another one. It might be uh, true for all of them. Well, Michael, rather than show the video, do you want to just give everybody just an idea of what perception is? More than happy to, more than happy to. Um, forgive me for not having the props that I'm usually famous for. The idea of perception is not only what you see and hear, but how you interpret what you see and hear. Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Blink, that many of us have either read or at least heard about, he says that he wrote the book because he wanted to describe in the blink of an eye we make judgments in terms of what's going on. There's many examples of that. The latest was a, uh, some research that came out that they interviewed 2,000 business owners and asked them when they interview people, how do they make their decisions? And they said that the average length of the interview is about 40 minutes long, but it's in the first 90 seconds that they make their judgment on whether they'll hire the person or not. And so it's awfully uh, huge amount of our decision and judgment 
is based on our first impressions and how we interpret the nonverbals of the other person. The reason why he wrote the book Blink was to indicate three possible things that we need to understand about perception. Number one is the idea that our first impressions are extremely powerful. They really do influence us. Number two, our impressions could be faulty. They maybe are not as accurate as we like them to be. And number three, you can educate the person to trust their instincts and know when to trust and when not to trust. And I thought, what a great book. Then all he does is tell stories for the rest of the 200 and plus pages. He never teaches you how to educate your instincts. I went, that's me. I teach people how to trust their instincts, when to and when not to. And so that's what we're going to be doing. Perception is what you see in here and how you interpret it. And then how do you make it more accurate so that you're not hallucinating? Could you share perhaps with everyone in uh, Michael, what's an example of that, that, that you've seen at play? Well, one of the things besides the idea of first impressions and how to hire people based on what they look like and how they move and how they sit, and they, def they especially said, your clothing. Your clothing makes a huge difference when you are doing first impressions, and it lasts for about 20 minutes. After that, it's real, whether you're competent or not. It's not whether you look a certain way or not. In the book, uh, Blink, one of the many examples they gave was that um, when police come upon a scene, they oftentimes will use their stereotypic impressions, statistical average of another person, and that's when they uh, misfire. Example, if they're in a minority section of a town, they're more likely to draw their guns faster and to use them more frequently than if they're in a higher social economic level of town. That could be called prejudice or it could be called a statistical average. The question is when can you trust your guts and when can't you? The other famous example they had in the book Blink was they showed a famous masterpiece painting to a group of uh, experts and most of the experts said yes it is authentic Yes, it's worth uh, millions of dollars. Uh, I think it was a Rembrandt or one of his colleagues. And only one person was able to say, no, it is a phony. It is not accurate. And they had to sort out why the other people thought it was authentic. And the one expert said, no, it isn't. And so when do you trust your instincts and when don't you? The other thing that we're going to be doing in Perception Camp is we're going to be looking at four levels of perception, and we're going to be covering three of them. The three levels are going to be how to look at one individual and try to figure out what their values, perceptions, filters are, and what are they likely to motivate them. The second level is very different than the first, and what it does is it talks about when you see two people interacting, how do you know who's going to be more likely to dominate not using in a negative sense, but influence the interaction between the two people. The third level is group dynamics. Each of those levels have a different set of questions. NLP is very good, and other psychological models, of teaching you how to read the individual. It's Michael, sorry, can I, just pa can I just pause you there? Because some people may not know what NLP is that's in our audience here. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, NLP is one of several models. It stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, and it's a model that is uh, founded, co-founded by my brother John. And Margot, stop me anytime I use language mm. that other people may not be familiar with. Uh, that's that's on me to uh, try to make sure I explain myself as I go. So sorry, you were saying there are the four levels. So NLP is part of the the, the first level. Anytime you're trained in any kind of psychological model, you will do very well with the individual, but you may not be trained in how to view two people, and we certainly need more help in terms of how to understand group dynamics. <coughs> Each of these levels, we have a book that we've written on and that we recommend uh, the, part the people that will be attending, if they could study those books and bring them with them, that'd be very helpful. 
for, in general, nonverbals, we recommend highly looking at our book called The Elusive Obvious. Can you maybe just in that, just before you go forward, Michael, just to help the people, because there's a number on the call that uh, have not done any work in that area. Could you perhaps just give an example of elusive obvious and specifically how that can help us in the workplace as, as, as speakers and influencers? The elusive obvious is a, uh, the subtitle is called the science of nonverbal communication. And what it does is it, uh, pulls apart what uh, oftentimes we hear when we read books called body language and it describes specifically how to understand what effect eye contact has between yourself and other people, how your voice patterns influence other people, and then how your body in terms of whether you gesture close or far, your palm is up, your palm is down, your palm is sideways, how that affects other people. It's a study of watching people for 40 years on four different continents and trying to figure out what is the cross-cultural relevance of watching someone's nonverbals. In other words, what is true apart from what culture you're in? And so it's very helpful in the workplace in that you can determine whether the person you're interacting with is trying to send you information or try to seek information from you. But more importantly, it teaches you your own nonverbals. Are you trying to seek or are you trying to send information to another person or a group? Your voice pattern, your body posture, and eye contact influence people on a regular daily basis. Perhaps, Michael, for many that are on the line, the great example that you used regarding the difference between the, the flight attendant and the pilot to help people understand whether they're seeking information or imparting. For all of us, we have to do that to be influencers. Perhaps you might expand on that. When you keep your head still, and I'm going to turn sideways so you can see, when you keep your head still, and especially if you have your palm down when you talk, your voice is going to sound like a pilot on an airplane. This is your captain speaking. We'll be flying to, from Perth to Sydney. It will take four hours and 50 minutes. If there's anything we can do to help you, don't hesitate to ask us. So he says all the right words, or she says all the right words, that we're here to serve you. But at the same time, that flat voice indicates, don't bother me, I am flying an airplane. So that's called the credible voice or the sending voice. The flight attendant normally will come on after the pilot and will talk more uh, in a rolling kind of voice that is much friendlier. And if you watch them when they're holding the microphone, talking to all the passengers, they're very approachable. This is called the approachable voice or the seeking voice. We'll be moving up and down the aisles. If there's anything we can do to help you, please let us know. We'll be serving you some beverages and let us know what you would like to drink. So you have two different voice patterns and what a difference it makes in terms of when you're running a meeting or conducting a presentation. Sometimes you want to send information. These are our hours and we'll be meeting back after lunch at 1.15. We appreciate you being on time. So we sound just like the pilot. But if we want to have a discussion in that same meeting, then we want to make sure that we have a kind of rolling voice. So what do you think? What is your outcome that you want? for this webinar in terms of understanding perception camp. So just on that note, Michael, perhaps just remind everybody again in the middle of this webinar, please send us a chat message if you've got particular questions or if you'd like us to unmute you, please just send us a message and we can help. So Michael, you were uh, giving us a better understanding of the one-on-one -on -one and the non-verbal and how we have perceptions and influence there. What about the second level up? When you're looking at two people and you're watching them interact, uh, in fact, let me get um, something and I'll be right back. That will be very helpful. I promise it'll take under 10 seconds. Have to start counting, Michael. <laughs> On that note, if there are any questions, love to get them from you while Michael just grabs that. You're a man of your word, Michael. It was definitely less than 10 seconds. Ooh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For some time, um, 
I would say for seven years. I tried to figure out a way to communicate to just our participants and fellow learners. How do you recognize who's likely to dominate or influence in any kind of an interaction? And there was a lot of psychological models out there in terms of, yeah, we could say that the pilot is more likely to dominate the flight attendant than the flight attendant is likely to dominate the pilot. At the same time, we wanted something that's more universal than just aviation. So we looked around and realized in my own house, I have a dog and I have a cat. And if I could have people just use their knowledge of household pets and transfer it to understanding people, it would make all the difference in the world and it would give them a good starting point. So we came up with the idea of having dogs. So dogs come when they're called and they're very friendly and they just want to please you. They will lick you to death. In fact, some dogs are terrible in terms of being guard dogs, but they certainly are friendly in terms of being a companion. So dogs are more likely to be dominated by cats than cats are to be dominated by dogs. And cats, they will do whatever they want. In fact, they will decide if they will come when you call them, whereas a dog will always come when you call them, even if they can't get there right away. They're trying. They're trying to get there. Whereas a cat go, you don't sound like it's a can opener. I don't think I'm interested. So we use the analogy of dogs and cats, and on the surface it's going to seem very simple, but if you really dig into it deeper, you realize there's tremendous amount of values and styles that are attached to the behaviors that we call dogs and cats. Cats tend to be very driven, they tend to be very ambitious, they like to get a lot done, and they're always looking at the bottom line. They're drawn to two very strong factors in terms of lifestyle. One is that they love tension and they love risk. So they tend to be promoted to very high levels of an organizational structure. So in an organization, if you want, you will tend to have the dogs on the bottom and the cats on the top. When you're in a dog position, how you interact with your boss or superiors, it is critical that you understand the difference. If you're the cat and you want to have a good working relationship with the dog, how you treat them is oftentimes intuitively different than what you would want to be treated like. So instead of doing the golden rule, treat other people the way you want to be treated, it depends on if it's a dog or if it's a cat. Margot, does that help in terms of what you were looking for? Fantastic. And would you like to just share with the listeners which is the, the piece of work? Because everybody wants to study more of what you can teach us. What's the piece of work we're best to read to understand cats and, and dogs? And that's going to be charisma. The mm -hmm. Art of Relationship, mm. Charisma, The Art of Relationship. Our books are uh, carried by, in Australia, Hawker Brownlow, and you also can get them directly from us on our website, michaelgrinder.com. The difference in the books is very, very slight. Uh, the ones from Hawker Brownlow don't indicate out in the margin a little icon that shows you where the worksheet is, but all the worksheets are free and downloadable from our website. MichaelGrinder.com. And we've included that link to for everybody as well, where they can go on and, and read the summary and the questionnaires. Clark, I've just unmuted you, hoping you're you're still there and want to talk. Clark, Clark, every time I see him, has one of your books under his arm. He does. He does. He's a walking advertisement for me. <laughs> I don't know whether you can hear me. I heard a yeah, big technical issue. Yeah, we can. Yes. Oh no, we, we can. can. That's fine. So. Greetings, Michael, and great to be here. Uh, what was your question again, Maga? Yeah, just a bit around how you find the resources, because for everybody to get value out of Perception Camp, the more they have an understanding of some of these models, the more value they can get from the session. Do you want to just uh, share just for 30 seconds your experience of working through some of Michael's uh, books and, and literature? Yes. Um, I think I can summarise it by saying it's made a profound difference to my speaking um capacity and my ability to be perceived as a, a very good speaker rather than not bad with good content. Um, I think that's probably the key thing. Plus I find um, what I've learned is transferable to other people and the feedback I get is extraordinary um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, um, how to present bad news to people by going to third point. Uh, and just people raising people's awareness. And I've mentioned this, I think, to both of you and to others in the group that 
it's probably the most significant thing that has affected my speaking career outside of me deciding <laughs> that I wanted to be a professional speaker. Um, right. And, and a professional coach. And the one thing we have to do as the coach is to be able to coach upwards as well, where we often have to play the cat or the dog, depending on, on the role and the relationship. Thanks, mm, Clark. Yes. Let's, let's hand it back right. to Michael. So, Michael, you, you've... Uh, gone through the one-on-one -on -one and then understanding some of the relationships. Would you like to take us through that to the next level? The third level is on the group dynamics. And group dynamics is extremely different than understanding two people interacting or just one. So let's put these two together as we move towards the third level of perception. If you're trained in how to understand what motivates someone and you start watching two people, if you take your training from understanding one person and you take it to two people, what you're going to do is you're going to try to understand both people's motivation, what's going on. And we suggest that the interaction is too fast and understanding what motivates each person is oftentimes too slow of a process. So we have to have a quicker process and we do that by switching from what motivates people to what is like, who's likely to dominate. When you get to group dynamics, the difference between one-on-one -on -one communication and group dynamics is the equivalent of if you were on one of your major highways in Australia or you were on a surface street in a neighborhood. If you're in a neighborhood, you're driving maybe 15, maybe 20 kilometers an hour and you're, you're looking straight ahead. If something comes out of the side, you'd be driving, driving slow enough that you could respond to it and you'd be fine. So you'd actually be in a reactive state. You drive in, something happens, you respond to it. When you get out on the freeway and you're zooming down, you have to see early what is likely to happen so you can prepare yourself. So the difference between one-on-one -on -one communication and group dynamics is they make all the signs bigger on our freeways, our motorways, so that we can read them early and respond proactively. So when you're looking at a group dynamic, the number one question you ask is the following what is likely to happen next, and that gives you more lead time to respond to it. And many of us shared in your learning of the group dynamics in a recent trip to Perth. Could you perhaps share with, with everybody online what, what, what's an example of things that you look for? Perhaps we can do an example I shared with you recently, speaking to 115-year-old girls. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, oh my goodness. I'll mention something and then you share that story because that's a great story, Margo. Mm -hmm. What we are finding is it's easier if you break groups into at least four different categories. Those four categories are, are they formed or unformed? And if they're unformed, then our task is to try to get them to be formed. They could be formed and then the question becomes, are they formed and functional or are they formed and dysfunctional? And then the last category of group is, are they healthy? Now, Margo, Adolescents are a very special, special group of people. In fact, if they weren't adolescents and you studied them as adults, you would say they need psychological help. <laughs> Share, if you would, just the natural um, dynamics that happen when teenagers get together, and it's a little bit special when it's all girls as opposed to girls and boys or all boys. Mm. Margo, what was your experience? My experience was as, as the speaker out the front is I had a pocket where it, there was an in-group and they were dominating the rest of the group. So I had to manage. There was a, a cat that was driving that group in the first place. So she had a whole lot of dogs around her. And so she was influencing the bigger group. So I had to use my mm. nonverbal skills that you've taught us on how to manage her and that group disrupting the bigger group. And as we've learnt, if I didn't manage that situation, I very yes. quickly lost control leading the entire room, which many of us have in, in many situations. You bet, you bet. And then the question becomes, do you take the cat straight on or do you try to remove the cat's audience? And there's at least 10 different strategies that you can look at in terms of, okay, well, what do I do? What will work in one situation may not work in another. And that's why adding to our repertoire of how to respond to given situations, how to read situations early, what a difference it makes. 
we do recommend that when you're going into a group, before you go in, try to ask the person who's in the know three questions. The first one is, what is the size of the group? And the reason why that's important is different sizes of groups will act differently. One of the things that uh, our good friend Darren Hill, who's a member of the National Speakers Association, what he says is that he's noticing that if a group is under 50, uh, they could uh, turn against you if they disagree with you either in terms of your looks, personality, or content. When you get above 50, they tend to want you to succeed. And for whatever reason, that is an amazing statistic that I'm going to be spending the next three to four months just watching because I have a variety of different groups that I'll be presenting to. This coming week, I'll have a group of 30. And then next week, I'll have a group of 65 for two days. And then I have a group of 36 for two days. And my goodness, I am so excited to be looking at those patterns. One of the second questions you want to ask besides the size of the group is you want to ask the, what is the um, length of time that they have been together or that you're going to be together with them. And the third question is, how well do they know, know each other? If they don't know each other, they will tend to be in what's called their public persona, politeness in other words. If they do know each other, such as the teenage girls, then you're going to end up having a very different kind of dynamics. So three questions to ask before you get in front of a group. Size, length of time, and degree of familiarity that you're going to have. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That inv uh, I imagine with our audience here, there are lots of questions because all of us have to manage different group sizes. Can some of you out there send me a message or put your hand up if you'd like me to unmute you and you can ask a question around that? I certainly ran, uh, as, just as I'm waiting for those questions to come through, I ran a series of programs just recently for my client and they varied in group size from about 9 to 16 and ran them progressively with different groups. And it was fascinating to see it was critical how I set the room up to manage the group mm. dynamics. And when we have the luxury of being doing something over and over, it certainly helps to yes. get that feedback. And it's almost like, uh, Margot, uh, as our fellow learners on the webinar will know, if you don't know your content, it is really difficult to focus on the process of how to deliver it. And it's even more difficult to focus outside of ourselves in terms of the group dynamics. Mm. So it's almost like different stages of our development. You got to know your content, make sure you deliver it often enough so that you can focus in terms of, I know what to say, now how do I deliver it? Then how do I deliver it is based on, can I watch the group and figure out what's going on and then adjust how I'm delivering based on the group. So at least a three-step process in our professional development. Mm, absolutely. And the, and, and the more you, you go, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> My experience for everybody that's on the line is that actually once you start to learn to manage the group, it's so much easier than trying to manage yeah. all the individuals that we're often trained to do. And there's really only four to six people in a group, even of 500, mm. that you have to watch. When Would you... we say watch, we mean that respectfully. Mm. And the people you want to watch are, who are the leaders? And how do you know the leaders? When someone speaks or moves or even sometimes comes in the door, the whole group will kind of hush because of the individual. And that's called a leader. It could be a negative leader or a positive leader, but you still have to figure out how you're going to live with that person. The second category of people, because there's four to six you want to watch, are the barometers. And the barometers are like the, oh, if you want to call it, the rose bush in front of a group of grapes. And anyone who has ever been to a vineyard knows that at the end of the rose, uh, sorry, at the end of the grapes, they have the rose bush. The rose bush is susceptible to the same disease as the grapes. So the person who's doing the work there, the vintner, they don't have time to look at their grapes and know are they okay. They look at the rose. If the rose is okay, they know that their groups of their grapes are okay. So you usually have two or three barometers in the room that will let you know how the group as a whole are doing. And then the last person that you have to have a working relationship with in any kind of group is called the liaison. And the liaison is almost someone who 
as old membership in a variety of subgroups. So instead of talking like a, about a dog or a cat, it'd be someone who's kind of a mixture of both because then that mixture of both could go between the pilots, use a guttural voice and say, we need to understand that the other group has some good ideas also. And then the cats will go, got it, thank you. We appreciate you telling us. Then you go over to the dog group and you go in a very soft voice. You know, I really think the people over in the other camp, they're well intended. They just have that kind of a kind of impatient voice. So maybe we can be patient with their impatience so we can understand what they're saying. So in trying to read a group, there's four to six people that you want to understand. And those four to six people are going to be your leaders, your barometers, and your liaisons. Marco, with your permission, and if we have somebody who has a question, we'd like you uh, to go ahead and beam them in. But I would like to read a couple of things from our notebook that we're going to be using, our manual, at the uh, camp. Because I think it gives a nice overview and a, a definition of what's going on. And then we want to talk about the benefits of attending. Is that OK? Certainly. I'm looking for more questions to come through. They're being very quiet out there, Michael. Well, the, the, one of the statements we want to share with you is that the average person only sees what they can describe. And that the above average person invents words to describe what they're actually seeing. And an example of this is <coughs> they did a study where a professor uh, had arranged with a student and this was well rehearsed between the particular student and the professor. What I'm about to share with you, I would never do. I think it is very, very, um, makes the, the learning unsafe. But as a demonstration, it was fantastic. The professor started in the front of the room with his normal lecture. A student in the back row started almost underneath their breath, starting saying, oh, remarks of saying, that's not true. And what happened was the professor up front and the student in the back, they started escalating. And as they escalated, they actually were standing up saying cuss words at each other. And at some point, the student pulled out a banana out of his jacket, pointed it at the professor. As that happened, there was a firecracker that went off in a trash can out in the hallway that sounded just like a gun. The professor took his hands pushed it against his jacket, and he had a little baggie of ketchup there, and the ketchup came out all over him, and he fell down. Immediately running into the lecture hall is the president of the university and the chief of police. They ask everyone, would you please write down exactly what you saw, because you are material witnesses to the shooting and perhaps a murder. They wrote down what they saw. Only one out of every 35 people ever see the banana because it doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense if there was a gun. So when you want to really understand what you see, if you really are going to be a pioneer, you have to invent your own vocabulary. And so I remember when I first started writing a book and I went to my dad, who was alive at the time, and said, you know, Dad, why should I write this book? I mean, come on. 95% of everyone who writes a book, they make under $5,000. And actually, it costs more to print it and publish it than the profit you make. And my dad looked at me and said, son, you're writing a book so that you can establish a vocabulary to describe what you teach people so that they'll come to you and learn your vocabulary. And so it just makes sense. Your vocabulary influences one's perception. Increase your vocabulary and you automatically increase your perception. So example tonight, we've talked about the idea of four, three levels of professional perception, which is the individual, two people, and the group. We've also talked about four kinds of groups, the those that are unformed, those that are formed and functional, those that are dysfunctional, and those that are healthy. Then we talked about inside of a group, you're trying to look for the leaders, you're looking for the barometers and you're looking for the liaison. We also talked about before you get in front of a group, your vocabulary are what is the size of the group, what is the length of time they've been together, and how well do they know each other. 
vocabulary is the key to your perception. One of the sayings also that we're going to be having, we'll put it up front, and it says this. If you can see half of what you look at, if you can see half of what you look at, you're good. If you know which half to look at, you're a genius. So one of the benefits of attending this camp, and it's not a training, it's a camp, is that you will know when you're hallucinating without evidence. And if you're not hallucinating, you're not. Then you have evidence to support what you think is going on. We're Can you just sorry, Michael, just at that point, do you think you could give people an example of hallucinating? So perhaps in the workplace or in the office, what we might experience? Well, the, the, the drastic one is the one where all the students saw the student mm. in the back with a gun that mm -hmm. killed the professor. Now, that's very dramatic, but I promise you, we actually make hasty judgments like that all the time in the workplace. In fact, one of the things you'll find is in Australia, we like to believe that we're all egalitarian. And then, as they uh, said in the great book, uh, Animal Farm, some of the animals seem to be a little more equal than the other animals. So even within the great middle class culture of Australia, we do have hierarchical systems. And it's important to understand that the when the higher person is talking to the lower person, they tend to have a certain voice pattern that is tend to be more the pilot. Mm -hmm. And the person on the bottom who's talking to the person on the top the superior tends to be more of a flight attendant. Mm. I had the pleasure of talking to Clive, a friend of mine, and don't need to mention his last name, that brought me into one of the big pharmaceutical companies in Australia uh, several years ago, and we happened to meet up in Skype this last week. And we both had a chuckle that when I explained about the higher position is more of a pilot and the lower position is more of a flight attendant, he absolutely did not agree. He went out at lunchtime we were meeting in his professional grounds. He happened to bump into someone who was his report, and he happened to bump into someone who he reported to. And he came back in the room laughing, realizing it's absolutely true. We close off the communication when we're operating from a higher position. And, and of course, the great example is when a boss turned to a middle management person and says, the report. We need the report by Tuesday. And then the middle management person, if they don't speak up and they just go out, they then take the report and they go to the subordinates and say, we need this report by Tuesday. And the bottom person who oftentimes has oftentimes the most factual information but does not have the interpretation of the superiors knows that you can't possibly get the report done by Tuesday. So come Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, the subordinate gives to the middle management the report, who gives it to the boss. The boss walks in, has a board meeting. During the board meeting, several members are opening up their agenda and they're looking through it and they realize section four is missing a whole lot of pages. And the boss gets so angry, and marches out of the room. He walks down to the middle manager and goes, you gave me this report. I said I needed it by Tuesday and section four is not done. The middle management goes down to the lower position person and says, you gave me this report and section four is not done. And the subordinate goes, I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. So we close off and don't utilize as much brain power as we could based on our voice patterns. Margo, is that a good example in terms of what you're yes, looking for? Yes, thank you. Yes. I had a client with exactly that issue yesterday, managing upwards. So she's feeling disempowered because her manager just tells, tells, tells with, mm -hmm. the, with the pilot voice. My daughter has uh, started to work with me, uh, and I say that because I originally hired her to work for me. And now I'm learning that if I don't, uh, in my mind, understand that we're, she's working with me and not for me, I miss all the brain power that she has. And so I, I just really have to uh, say just because uh, I have different levels of experience and I have a different title than she does inside of Michael Grinner and Associates, that doesn't mean that uh, she doesn't need to be motivated and empowered, appreciated and encouraged to explore. 
one of the things that I think is the biggest difference uh, between what we call our camp and a training is that in a training I have some information I set it up so that you learn it and you get to practice it the camp is very different in the training we give you here are the principles sorry here are the um, if you want to call it rules of communication such as when you have that flat voice you're sending when you have that rolling kind of voice you are seeking so most of what I teach is based on what we call do this or don't do this it's called the science a camp is based on the art the art says there are no hard and fast rules they're very fluid so instead of having the scientific always do this or never do that we use axioms so axioms are principles their generalizations and they are generalizations that you have to then apply to each given situation and that's why it's considered an artistic level in the format of the actual training and excuse me while I take a sip of tea here while you're going into your fall we're coming into our summer so um, the allergies for country living people like myself are pretty high right now so forgive my voice the format is that people will bring clips of footage of people they can bring an individual they can bring two people interacting or they can bring group dynamics but even in a group dynamic we can say in this group dynamic there's only one person I want us to focus on so the footage doesn't have to be just of one person but the focus or the emphasis could be on just one person when you figure out which level do you want to focus on the individual two people or the group then you're gonna take that clip and you're gonna study it outside the room with at least two other people and we'll give you a packet of papers like there's three pages to help you figure out the values of an individual there's four or five pages that will help you figure out who's likely to dominate when two people are interacting and then lastly you will have a whole set of pages and it will help you figure out the group dynamics and of course we do recommend bring your books because your books will have more information than just these pages so then some of us, so, sorry, Michael, some of us could bring a film clip of uh, Modern Family, for example, or we Ooh, could one of my favorites. I know. Or we could bring a film clip of a meeting that some of us have participated in. Or a clip from a famous movie, TV mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. It could actually be your own self presenting. You get to decide. Excellent. So those that are speakers on the line might want to bring, but if we're bringing just us up on stage, then we've got to decide whether or not we actually want the footage of the, of the audience as well. Correct. Correct. Sorry, I cut you off then, Michael. What were you going to add? No, to please, that? please continue. You, you have a better perspective than I in terms of what the viewer is looking for as opposed to uh, me trying to cover the content. So the first time we see it, it will be two to three minutes long and we just watch it in silence, the whole group, the whole camp. The second time you show it, you make sure that you control the mouse. And as you are showing it, anytime you want to stop the video footage and describe what you see based on you haven't studied those pages, we watch and we say, ah, okay, ah, we see that. So we're going to look for, sorry, Michael, in that, just to uh, expand it out, we're going to look for facial expressions gestures, vocal patterns, in terms of who's got the influence in that situation or who's, who's creating more or dominating more. Absolutely. Thank you for, for doing a specific on that. So each of the three levels have a different set of papers. So when we're looking at an individual, and this is what we're going to cover more in July, is that you're actually watching them when they're changing mental or physical states. So when someone is talking and they pause, that is a shift and you want to watch them during that pause because the information you'll get during the pause is more important than the information you get when they talk. So that's why we have the axiom. If you can see half of what you look at, you're good. But if you know which half, you're a genius. So let's, so let's make it real for people. They're in a performance review with their boss. What did you mean by that? Or, or many of us uh, might, on the line are having an interview. So what did you mean when they're pausing? That tells us more than what they actually say. 
And some of us on the line will be trained in what's called eye patterns, where if during the pause a person's pupils go up high, then you know that they are looking at the next bit of information that they're going to talk about from a visual memory in their mind. If they break eye contact and look off to the side and then come back, they're bringing back auditory memory, conversations, descriptions, uh, if you would, uh, previous dialogues. And if the person looks down and then comes back, they're coming from their feelings. They're being uh, in touch with their gut. And in doing that, it makes a huge difference in terms of uh, whether you respond. For example, if someone is bringing back in terms of pictures, then if you can paint a picture of what you're trying to communicate, they're more likely to receive it because it matches how their brain thinks. So drawing a diagram comes, or something like that. Very, very helpful if you go external visual in terms of showing them something. And in fact, you can actually watch those people that are highly visual. Normally, you want to give them a proposal before you meet with them. Or if you give it to them, sit there silently and let them look at it. Because until they get a picture, they really can't dialogue in terms of what they want to talk to you about. If the person is auditory, then they probably won't read anything until they first talk with you. If the person is highly looking down and then coming back, that style of processor actually would like to have an example. And that's why, Margo, I appreciate you keep um, encouraging you or I or both of us to give an example because that's a style that I'm not doing tonight as well as, sorry, this morning as well as I would like. <laughs> it's only just morning, 10 more minutes. And it, I think it's lunchtime for our Eastern Seaboard. Well passed, so you're doing well. Well passed, well passed, well passed. Uh, I would like to take just a moment and talk about that third time that we look at the video footage because the third time uh, I have the mouse and I pause it and tell you what I can see. So your perceptual awareness and increase is what you can see versus what I can see and that's how you grow. So that you're literally spending five days walking around in my mind in terms of how I see reality. So that's going to stretch us. Ooh, you'll be stretched like no other time. That's why we have to have five days. You just, you can't do it in under that. It just, it's a mental shift. It's, it's, in fact, let me um, end on something that might be very helpful here. Bear with me. This is going to be another um, under 10 seconds. Margo, are you ready to count? Yes. And just as you're doing that again, we're, we're going to be uh, closing the webinar shortly, and we have another opportunity in a month to be with Michael. Are there any questions? Please put your hands up. Any comments you'd like to make? I will unmute a few of you before the, the end. They're being very quiet out there, Michael. Well, one of the questions you can ask them is, uh, how many people um, already own one or more of the books that we mentioned, which is The Elusive Obvious, The Science of Nonverbal Communication. The second one was Charisma, The Art of Relationship about dogs and cats. And the third one was about the whole area of uh, group dynamics. Oftentimes the title of the book is called Managing Groups, The Fast Track. Could you raise your hand if you own one or more of those books? Yes, we've got a few few coming up. And the reason that we're particularly interested is for those that will be attending to make sure that you've, you've got a copy because it will help you get the most out of it. And not all the ones that are, are registered to attend are online, of course, today, Michael. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Margo, I know we have to end, and I wanted to show you an example of what is perception? Uh, this is a painting of someone who's chiseling out their own professional growth. And you'll see that what is around the painting is this mat. And the mat is a certain color. So while you see reality, you interpret reality or what you see in reality is based on your perception. Sorry, what Michael, is that is that frame, I couldn't quite understand. Did you say MAP, M-A-P, oh. or MAT? Oh, sorry, M-A-T. -A -A MAT, good, great. Mat. Mat. So 
So if we change the math, and it's hard because this is through electronics, but you have a different frame around it. You see different colors inside the actual art piece. The art piece hasn't changed, but you see it differently. What Perception Camp does is it gives you many, many more filters than you now have so that you can see reality differently than you now see it and more accurately. The more accurate you are in terms of understanding what you see and hear and you interpret it accurately, the better communicator you would be. Brilliant. That's a very powerful explanation and demonstration of the, the visual for us visual learners and the kinesthetic learners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, once in a while I do, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the things we can look at is the area of... Uh, one of the questions... I, I won't try the, it now. No, okay, Michael. One of the questions Go that ahead. came through is... Uh, oops, hang on, it just went up. Uh, if we can find the video he wanted to show us. Oh, the video you wanted to show at the start um, when you brought the um, Malcolm Gladwell's blink. Is it up on YouTube so we can watch later? Uh, no, it's not. I will try to get it organized in preparation for our next meeting in July. Uh, when we tested it out, it tested fine. I actually have four separate clips, and I will post them uh, after we meet in July. Excellent. And uh, our very special friend Margaret over the over East is, will we will we be chiseling ourselves out of our own concrete at the camp? <laughs> I think you're well, you already have... beautifully chiseled, Margaret, myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well uh, I think that one of the huge benefits of coming to the camp is that you'll be with other like-minded people that, because um, this is a very, very ambitious group. In fact, we actually came up with the ingredients, Margot, that we think makes the best perception camp learner. And this is not true of people that come to regular trainings, just in terms of camp. We find that they have to be ambitious, persistent. They have to have a pioneering spirit. Pioneering by that we mean they have to be uh, curious and be able to handle initial feelings of going, I don't understand this. Because we really do want to take you through looking at reality very differently. And then the last thing is the huge benefit of being with other people that you can form relationships with become lifelong fellow learners. One of the most important things you can consider is try to bring a colleague or a friend with you so you can get the same experience and most importantly the same vocabulary and that will put you in good stead so that after the week long is over you'll continue to do your learning. Well it helps, I've brought my husband coming along. <laughs> I just absolutely. need that 16-year-old daughter of mine there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So for those of us in, in Perth, many of us who are coming to the Perception Camp have uh, have studied together before, so we can build on that. But there's a lot of other people that haven't studied with you before, so they will uh, come and, up to speed very quickly. And what we did, uh, Margo, just to repeat, we've designed a, um, a basic 21 questions with uh, answers that are organized on uh, both of our websites that people can go to and study. And then uh, what they do is after they've studied the question and the answer, then they just go to another section that has just the questions. They fill out their answers and email them to me and I will correct them, send them back to you. We've never had anyone not pass. We just suggest, well, maybe you wanna study this particular item a little bit more, but we always have people pass that quiz and then they're just in good stead because they have all the vocabulary needed to start the process of learning reality. Marvellous. And, and to reinforce, that that quiz is not as we ex my children experience at school, you know, pass or fail. It's all around all of us having that common vocabulary when we're together to accelerate collectively together. Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. And I just want to say for the people that uh, I've been with before, I just can't tell you how great it is to have a safe learning atmosphere where we just have fellow learners around us. That, that to me, is one of the real joys of life. Mm. Hear, hear. 
Well, we're uh, out of time at the moment, and I imagine that people have got tremendous value out of this. Would you just like to cover again, Michael, what you're going to cover in the second webinar that we do together in, in more detail? In sec second webinar, we're going to just cover individuals. How yes. do you recognize what motivates them, what are their values, what are their style? And we're going to really say, when you see this behavior, it means this. This behavior seems this. And that's where we're going to get very, very specific. Mm -hmm. So tonight was intended to be an overview. And thank you for making sure that I gave examples as I went along. Exactly. And there's many on the line who have been students of mine in my program. So that will be highly relevant. So for those of you who know who you are on the line, that will, will help on the nonverbals. Excellent. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. we'll bid you good night. The West Australians will have lunch and the East Coasters will go for afternoon tea. Oh, what a, what a good arrangement for the whole day being covered. I know. What a wonderful global world we uh, we share. Everybody's Absolutely. coming back. I'm getting so many thank you messages now, Michael, which oh, good, I'll good, share, good. share with you. Have a wonderful evening and, and day for the rest of us and speak in a month's time. Details of the next webinar are on the Positive Persuasion website as well as michaelgrinder.com. Farewell. Pleasure, pleasure.